Hi. This week in class, we talked about valuing equity in deeply distressed companies as an option. So what I'd like to do is trace back the logic behind that argument and then take you through the example of a distressed company to see how, in fact, we can apply this approach to valuing equity in a company. So let's start off with what makes equity in a distressed company potentially an option. You buy equity in a publicly traded company, the first thing you get is a residual claim. You get whatever's left over in terms of cash flows every year when you operate. And if you liquidate the company, you get whatever's left over after everybody else has been paid off. So that's the first piece of the puzzle, is recognizing that equity is a residual claim. Second, equity guys, if, assuming you're not in bankruptcy court, run the business. So they can choose to run the business, they can choose to liquidate the business. No equity investor can ever be forced to continue to run a business they don't want to. So if equity investors collectively decide to liquidate the firm, the same residual principle applies. You liquidate the firm, you get the liquidation proceeds, you pay off the debt, and you get to keep the difference. And there's a third layer to this argument. If you're an equity investor in a publicly traded company, you have limited liability. What I essentially mean by that is you cannot lose more than what you originally paid for the stock. In other words, your stock can go to zero, but it can't go any lower. Those are the three pieces that make equity behave like a call option, at least in some companies. So let me set up the payoff diagram. Let's first be clear on what this option is. It's the option to liquidate a business. So you're the equity investors, you run a business, you have the option to liquidate a business. If you do liquidate the business, you get a liquidation proceeds, a value for the business. And if you do liquidate the business, I'm going to assume that the first claim on the liquidation proceeds goes to your lenders, and they get the face value of the debt back. If there are any proceeds left over, you get to keep the difference as the equity investor. Well, of course, that might not be the case, in which case the value of the assets is less than the face value of the debt. What you lose, what you originally paid for the stock. How long do you get to play this option game? Well, you as the equity investor get this power to decide what to do, to decide whether to liquidate or not, to keep the goal. As uh, You get to do this only until the debt comes due. The minute the debt comes due, the power shifts back to the lenders because they can determine whether you continue or not. So the life of this option is whatever remaining life there is in your debt. So that's the example we set up in class. We use an abstract example of a company where I gave you the face value, I gave you the potential, the fa the fa the, I basically gave you a zero coupon bond with, with a face value and a maturity, and I gave you the value of the assets. And we talked about applying this to a real company, but we really didn't get a chance to try it out very much. So what I'd like to actually do is try to see if I can use this approach to value equity in a deeply troubled company. The company I'm going to use is a company called Jet India. Jet India is an Indian airline, and it's an Indian airline in a lot of trouble. How much trouble? Well, in 2012, the company reported a net loss of 7,798 million and an operating loss actually an operating profit, a tiny operating profit. Already I'm giving you a glimmer of what the company's problem is. It is making a tiny operating profit, but it's a huge net loss. That effectively must mean that there were a lot of financing expenses. And you're going to see that show up in, a, in, a, in, in the next bullet point. The company's actually been losing money for a while. In fact, the way we know that is if you look at the book value of equity for Jet India, it's minus 18,277 million. So this is obviously a company where losing is part of the game. They've been doing this for a while. The company has a huge amount of debt outstanding. It's got about $114,272 million in debt. Most of the debt is tied to the acquisition of aircraft, and it's pretty long-term debt, and that, in fact, is going to bail them out. That's what's going to give them some potential hope, is the debt, on average, has a weighted maturity of about four and a half years. In theory, I should be taking a weighted duration of the debt, but I, unfortunately, in this example, I did not have enough information on the debt to be able to flesh out when exactly the coupon payments were due. So I'm going to use the maturity as if it were my duration. So I've got a money-losing company with a lot of debt, and the debt is long-term. I have the ingredients for arguing for a liquidation option. Now, there are two key inputs I need for the liquidation option. One is I need a value for the assets of the company, assuming I sell it today. And there are two ways I can estimate that value. One is to do a traditional discounted cash flow value, and I will essentially take you through the process of how I tried to value Jet India using a discounted cash flow model. And the value that I got using that approach is 61,639 million. In fact, this might be a good time to, to essentially open that, the, the, the discounted cash flow value. And the discounted cash flow value is right here. 
Okay. So there's my discounted cash flow value. There's the November 2013 is when I'm doing the valuation. There's Jet India. It's an Indian company. It's an air transport company. The revenues have essentially gone up. And that's actually something to keep in mind. Even in the midst of all this trouble, the revenues are growing about 13% over the last year, between 2011 and 2012. Their operating loss became an operating profit. They have huge interest expenses because of the debt. Their book value of equity is negative. They have a huge amount of debt. I'm going to assume that there's no R&D to consider in an airline and that the lease expenses, even though they might have a few, are too spotty to actually bring into account. They have some cash, 1,454 million. The number of shares outstanding is 86.33 million and the stock is trading at $325 per share. Right now, they're paying nothing in taxes because they're losing money. But at some point in time, when they do pay taxes, I'm going to assume the tax rate is going to move towards the Indian tax rate of 33.99%. Now here come the assumptions that are going to let me pull this company out of the hole. So this is a fairly optimistic DCF valuation in some sense. I'm going to assume that the company is going to be able to tap into growth in the Indian airline business, in the Indian airline market, and get a revenue growth of 15% a year, which is not outlandish if you think about the growth rate they've been able to post even in the near, in, in the recent past. I'm also going to assume, and this is key, that their, their margins will improve. These are their operating margins. They'll improve to 4.84%, which happens to be the industry average for global airlines. So I'm assuming they're going to move towards that. If you notice, for the next 10 years, I'm going to assume they can get away with very little investment. They're going to, for every $10 in revenues, they've got to invest a dollar in capital. Part of the reason for that is they actually have bought a lot of the aircraft. They can take, they have excess capacity that they can take advantage of. So at least for the near term, they're going to be able to get away without reinvesting much. The risk-free rate I used was the Indian rupee risk-free rate as of 2013. And the cost of capital reflects two things. One is it reflects the fact that almost all of their business is, is in India. So the risk premium that you're going to see is actually the risk premium for India. They have, no, they, they have very little revenues outside India and the fact that it's an airline company with a lot of debt. So bring those factors together. The cost of capital for the company in repeat terms is 16.83%. That's pretty much it. Let me show you what the numbers look like in the valuation. So these are my projected numbers. The revenues go from 188 all the way up to, so I almost quadruple or, or triple, at least triple, probably you know, three point four, my revenues go up three and a half times. I come up with uh, the cash flows every year. I discount those cash flows back at the cost of capital. And the value that I get for the operating assets, I'm going to stop right there, is 61639 million. Ignore everything below that because if this were a discounted cash flow valuation, the rest of the valuation is going to look puzzling. Because my value of the operating assets is 61639. I owe 114272 million in debt. The equity is obviously worth nothing. You're saying, why would I even think about investing in the stock? Here's where the option argument, I think, comes into play. So let me go back to my to my slides and and show you the value. 61,639. That's the value that I'm going to get, that I'm assuming is what I'll get if I try to sell the business today on the assumption that somebody will pay me on the presumption of growing revenues and margins improving. If you feel that that's too much work and that you really can't do it, there's a shortcut I could have used here. For instance, the EBITDA that uh, for your Jet India is 9,417 million. You know? So it's a pretty healthy EBITDA. A mature airline company, and I'm using a global average, trades at about seven and a half times EBITDA. You apply 7.5 to the 9.417 billion. It's just kind of a back of the envelope estimate of the value of, that, of the company is about 70,628. So we'll try both in the option model, but I'm going to start with the 61,639 as my DCF value for the operating assets of the company. One final piece, I need a volatility in that value. I could have tried other uh, no, other approaches, but I could have even looked at the past stock price of the Jet India, but I don't trust those numbers very much. They're very, 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 you know, because it's uh, so, so highly levered, the stock prices are not exactly the most dependable numbers to focus on here. So I decided to use an industry average standard deviation in firm value. Basically, I'm going to use that as my standard deviation for Jet India's value over time. Unfortunately, I don't have that number for Indian Airlines, but I do have it for U.S. companies. And I know it's, this is a, do, it's a different sector, but at least to start the option, I'm going to use that as my standard deviation is 46.4%.
Incidentally, if I'd had the stomach for it, I could have taken my discounted cash flow value, made it into a simulation, and come up with the standard deviation across values. I chose not to do that. I chose to take the easy way out. But that's pretty much all I need from for, in terms of my input. So now let me go to my option pricing model. So let's start at the top. For the value of the firm, I'm entering in the value that I got from my DCF model, 61639 million. The approach I'm going to use here, and it gives you three choices, industry average, you know, say a direct input, or you know, based on the firm. I'm going to use the industry average, the I. And because I've used the industry average, I'm going to have to enter the number. The business I'm in is the air transport business, and the standard deviation I'm using is the US airline standard deviation, which is 46.4%. So it's a pretty volatile business, and we know that already. You could, have, uh, you could have also used past stock and bond prices if you had them available for your company to come up with a standard deviation. Alternatively, you could have just directly inputted a number that you felt was a reasonable standard deviation. Maybe you have a gut feeling about standard deviations. I don't, but maybe you do. That's pretty much it because there's no real cost to delay here. It's not like that you're, the company's paying dividends or reducing its value over, uh, over time. So with those inputs, this is what the numbers, oh, finally, I ask you for the face value of the debt, which is 114,272. I ask you for the maturity, four and a half years. The risk-free rate is 8%, and this is what the inputs look like to my model. For the under value of the underlying asset, I have my discounted cash flow value. For the strike price, I have the face value of the debt. And if you had option, uh, you know, if, you had, uh, if you had operating leases, you could basically capitalize those leases and throw them in as well. For the expiration in years, I've used the weighted maturity of my debt, four and a half years. For the T-bond rate, I'm using the risk-free rate in rupees for the life of the option, four and a half years, which is 8%. The variance is going to be the 0.464 squared, which is what the 0.21, et cetera, et cetera, that you see for variance is. And finally, there's no dividends. D1 and there's D2, N of D, those are pretty standard output, right? But remember again, N of D2 is very roughly speaking a risk neutral probability that S will be greater than K. And we talked about this in class, but you, in, you take the, uh, if you take one minus N of D2, in this case, that'll be about 77.5%, one minus 0.225, that's roughly speaking the probability of bankruptcy at Jet India. So is there a high chance that Jet India could go bankrupt? Absolutely. It's about 77.5%. But that's no surprise if you think about how much they owe and what the value that I'm getting for the business is. But here's the surprising factor. In spite of the fact that my operating assets are worth only 61639 and that I owe 114272 million, the value that for the equity that I'm getting for Jet India is about 18463 million. That is still lower than the 27,000 that the stock is trading for, but at least I'm within shouting distance. And I would argue that if you're investing in Jet India, then you're investing in Jet India because it's an option, not for the cash flows, because the cash flows are all negative, not for dividends, excuse me, but, but because it's an option. So the value that you're getting for the option is 18,463 million. In fact, I backed out the interest rate you should charge on the debt. And guess what? You should be charging a hefty premium. And why shouldn't you? There's a very high chance of default. So that's the basic approach. And in fact, let's try a few what ifs, right? So let's go back in here. And the value that I got, if you keep your my, keep your eye on it, is 18,463. The first thing I tried was, what if my debt were 10-year debt instead of four and a half year debt? Right? That's the only thing I'm going to change. Everything is going to stay the same. Let's see what happens to the value of the equity. It almost doubles. The longer the term of my debt, holding all its constant, the more valuable equity will become if I have a deeply distressed company because I get more time to play the game. So let me fix that back again. Let's talk about the debt itself. Let's say I owe more money. Actually, that, that's not going to work. So let me, no. I could make it more money. Let's try this. Let's say I owe, let's say at what point the equity becomes worthless. What if I owed 150 no, million instead of 114 million? Well, the equity still hangs in there, right? It doesn't go away. So you could owe a lot of money, but if there's enough variance in the value, you still might be okay with it. So let me fix that again. So the debt goes back to what it was, 114 to 72. Let's try one other thing. What about the variance? What if I make the variance zero? What if it's a completely safe business? And discounted cash flow valuation, that's a good thing, right? Let's see what happens to the value of an option. Okay, it has no value. The value here comes from the fact that there is uncertainty about the future. In fact, if this were 60%, so 46.4, the 
the value of the equity would jump to 25 million. So the more risky the business, the more equity is worth. So the value of the business matters, the variance in that value matters, how long term your debt is matters, and all of those things drive in making your act or determine whether the equity in a distressed company will be worth a lot or not. So let's review. If you're looking at equity in a deeply distressed company, the first thing to do is to value the company's assets in place right now using either a conventional discounted cash flow model or multiples. Once you have that number, then you can go to the, then you can set off for the races. You can try to apply an option pricing model by coming up with a variance in that value by either using industry averages or a simulation. Look at how long term your debt is and make the debt the equivalent of your strike price and see if you can value the option. If nothing else, it'll give you new insights into what drives the value of equity in deeply troubled company. Thank you very much for listening.